This begins our coverage of the material from Lecture 7 of ELEC 5300. In this lecture, we'll be talking about uh, parameter estimation. So up to now, we've usually assumed that the probability distributions of the random variables that we're dealing with are completely known. In other words, we know both the functional form, for example, Gaussian, exponential, uh, Poisson, and we know all the parameters of that distribution. For example, in the Gaussian distribution, uh, we might need to know the mean and the variance. Uh, in the exponential distribution, we might just need to know the mean. So, <clears throat> in many cases, the assumption that we know the functional form of the probability distribution uh, is a reasonable one. For example, we might know that the <clears throat> random variable that we're dealing with is the sum of a bunch of small effects, independent effects, and the central limit theorem would tell us that a Gaussian distribution would be a good distribution uh, in that case. However, we might not know or be able to figure out what the mean and the variance uh, of that Gaussian distribution might be. And so what we would like to do then is actually estimate uh, these from data. In other words, if we actually have data of the random variables that we are trying to model, um, then we'd like to say, well, given this data, what is a good estimate of these unknown parameters, the mean and the variance? Now, what I'd like to uh, distinguish at this point is a kind of a difference between uh, two types of estimation. One is uh, where the parameters that we're trying to estimate are themselves random variables. And so that implies then that there's some known distribution about the random variables, about the parameters. So for example, uh, we might have some idea that uh, the mean of the Gaussian that we have is within some range or is close to a certain value. Uh, but we don't know exactly where it is. Uh, so we'd like to take that information into account. Uh, so some of the uh, example algorithms that we have for this are the maximum, I'm sorry, minimum, minimum, mean squared error estimation um, that we studied in the past uh, lecture, uh, the Wiener filter, uh, and things that we'll study moving forward like the Kalman filter and the maximum a posteriori uh, estimate. In other cases, uh, we might want to remain completely agnostic about what we think the parameters uh, might be. And we'll just say, well, I'm just going to assume that there's some unknown constants. Uh, and I have no idea what these constants are. They could be anything. Uh, and so in that case, really what I'm going to do is I'm just going to completely trust uh, the data that I see, whatever the data tells me, um, I'm just going to believe that because I have no prior uh, assumptions about what the parameters, what reasonable values the parameters might be. And so example algorithms of this are the uh, maximum likelihood estimator. Um, and the EM algorithm is a implementation of the maximum likelihood uh, estimator. We won't cover that uh, in this class, though. So what I'd like to do now is just talk about uh, the second uh, category of estimation algorithms. In particular, we'll be talking about the maximum likelihood estimator. So the assumptions that we'll make in this part of the class is the following. We'll assume that the density has a known functional form, uh, and it only depends on a set of parameters which are unknown. Uh, for example, in the case of a Gaussian, uh, we might assume that the mean and the variance or covariance matrix are unknown. Uh, and we'll usually loop or group the uh, set of unknown parameters uh, into a parameter vector, or which we'll call theta. And so because the distribution over the, day, uh, the things that we're trying to model, x, uh, depends on theta, uh, we often say f of x given theta. Now, in order to <coughs> figure out the complete distribution now, really, we just are left with a numerical problem. We just have to find the numerical values of these parameters theta. Uh, 
And so in order to do that, we're going to assume that we have some uh, data which are drawn from the distribution that we're trying to model. And we're going to call that data x1 through xn. So we assume that we have n samples. And intuitively, what we expect is the larger the value of n, the better the estimate we'll be able to get. We'll also assume that these n samples are independent. Right? So that it's not like I'm repeating the same variable of the same measurement in the data set uh, or that there's some correlation between uh, the samples. And so in that case, it allows us uh, to write the probability distribution in a form <coughs> where the probability distribution of or the entire data set, big D, can be written as the product of the probabilities of the individual pieces of data. Um, and all of these probabilities have exactly the same form. In other words, they're identically distributed. So let's take a look at the idea of maximum likelihood estimation. Now, usually we'll assume that we have some data. So let's look at just a 1D problem here. So we have some data, x, and that might lie in a certain region of the real line. And maybe we assume that the distribution of this data is given by a Gaussian with a known variance. Right? So in other words, uh, what we have is we have the situation where we have um, a Gaussian distribution, which is again like a hill. Right? And the shape of the hill is basically the same. The only thing that might change is the location of the mean. Right? So this hill might shift. Uh, so let's say from here, or another guess of the hill. And these two things look should look almost identical, except for that shift. Or actually, it should be exactly identical, except for the shift. Um, and what we want to do is we want to choose the value of this shift, right? either over here or over here, or any other place. right? And so if we just look at these two distributions, we can immediately see, well, one of them looks like it's a more reasonable guess than the other one. If the data here is given by these red x's, right, then you say, well, I don't think it's this one over here. right? Because if it was this distribution, if the value of m was this one over here, then I would expect to see most of the red crosses you know, in this region over here. But instead, I see them kind of over in this region here. So I think that this one looks like a better um, <clears throat> guess of what the actual distribution is. Right? But then the question is, well, you know, what is the actual value of m that I should choose? Should it be the value here? Or should I move it over a little bit? Or should I move it over to the right? Or where should I actually put that value of m? One kind of intuitive idea that immediately or <clears throat> would after a little bit of thought might spring to mind is, well, maybe I want to put that value of m in the middle of all these points. right? And so what would I mean by the middle of all these points? Maybe that might be the average of all those points. Uh, and so in turn, it turns out that, in fact, for the case of the Gaussian, that is a good idea. Okay, but we need to have a more general uh, formulation, and in particular for the Gaussian, uh, we'd like to know, well, is that really a good idea? In what sense do we mean uh, that that's a good idea? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to need to come up with a numerical measure of how good this estimate of the mean is. Right? And the numerical measure that we're going to use is something which we call the likelihood. And so the larger the likelihood, 
the better this distribution is. That's the claim. And so what is this likelihood? Well, the likelihood um, is really the length of all of the lines that connect these data points to the assumed distribution, right? So let's assume that, you know, we have this distribution over here, which I'm going to recolor in green. So suppose our guess was, oh, I think it's the green distribution, right? What I might do is I might say, well, okay, let's look at the values of the probability distribution at the data point, right? And the values of the probability distribution under this assumed distribution here are relatively small. That's the reason that I kind of think that this is not a good estimate of the probability distribution. And so one way I might kind of combine these values is I could multiply them all together, right? So I can multiply all these values together, and I would get some single likelihood number. And then I say, well, that number, that likelihood achieves a certain value. And then I say, well, what about this other distribution? So let's take another uh, color, let's say the blue color. And here we're again going to draw the lines from the, each of the data points to the value of the distribution. Right? And now we immediately see, well, these lines, generally speaking, are longer, but we want to have, again, one number to summarize the kind of length of those lines. Uh, and we'll, again, multiply all those guys together. And I'll talk about why multiplying them together uh, is a good idea, rather than, say, for example, adding them together or something like that. But now we see that this one that we thought uh, originally, based on just looking at the distribution, was a better guess. We can see that generally the lines are longer. And so what we'd expect is the likelihood uh, would be larger. Right? And so if we actually plotted uh, the likelihood as a function of how the mean changed, right? so now what I'll do is I'll uh, put another axis on top here. And I will call this thing the likelihood. And so now this is really indicating the value of m, the mean, right? And what I could do is I could, for this value of the mean here, I could go up here and I could say, well, what is the product of all of these green lines here? And so it looks like that that one's relatively small, right? What's the product of all the blue lines? over here, right, for this assumed distribution, that looks like it's pretty big, right? Now, of course, if I had another distribution, let's say the orange distribution over here, then that one looks like it would be pretty small, right? If I look at all the lengths for the red line to the or from the red crosses to the orange line. That looks like it would be pretty small. And so you can do that process for all values of mean in, be in between here and here. And so if I do that, uh, then you can kind of imagine that it would be smaller over here. It would go through here. Then once we get into this region over here, it might get bigger. Right? And then come down and then eventually die down. And when we say we're going to take the maximum likelihood estimate of the mean m, what we mean is that we're going to take the point here, let's say it looks like this point here, that maximizes the likelihood, where the point where this likelihood is the larger. And so this thing here is what's called the MLE, or the maximum likelihood estimate. OK, so going back to uh, the slides, this is essentially what I've shown you uh, in this diagram over here. These are the dist different distributions. Uh, the red are the data points. This is the likelihood uh, that we have here, which is the product of all those points. Uh, and it turns out that uh, the reason I took the product was exactly because of this IID assumption. Right? Actually, the length of all those lines, 
from the data points to the di assumed distribution are these guys here. And so if I want the probability or the likelihood over of the entire data set D, I just multiply all of them together. Okay. But you might say multiplying is not really uh, very nice because you know I don't like to multiply. It's more difficult than doing other things, for example, like adding. Right. And so I'd like to do something uh, that involves adding. So in order to do that, uh, what I do is I take the logarithm of the likelihood. Right. And so that's shown here. I'm going to give that a form uh, a notation L of theta. And L of theta is <coughs> called the log likelihood. And because the like the log is a increasing function of x or log, let's say I have x here and I have log of x here, that looks like this. Because as I increase x, I increase the log, and as the log increases, it implies x increases. Then if I take the maximum value of the likelihood, uh, it's going to be achieved at the same value at which the log likelihood achieves its maximum value. And so um, it's equivalent then to either maximize the likelihood or maximize the log likelihood. But the reason that we want to maximize the log likelihood uh, is that it converts this multiplication that we had over here into a sum. Right? And the reason for that is, well, if I take the log of a product, log of a times b, then I get log of a plus log of b. Right? So if I take the log of f here, which, where f is a product, then I just get the sum of the log of the distributions. Right? And so in order to find the maximum of the log likelihood, we just do the standard technique of setting, taking the gradient of the log likelihood and setting that thing equal to 0. And this at first looks a little bit ugly because I have this log, I've introduced this log inside here. Um, and, you know, you can say, well, you've made things sums, but you have to take the log. And doesn't that make things harder because I don't really like logs, I don't understand logs that well. Uh, but in fact, we'll find surprising that actually logs uh, makes our life easier. 